Good Monday morning, and thanks for listening to my musing today, which is about personal power. Your personal power. But to get there, I want to tell a short story that has been stuck in my mind for a long time. Do you have a million dollar plan? Like, have you ever dreamed, if I was going to make a million dollars like tomorrow, this is how I would do it. This is my million dollar plan, and I came up with it whenever I was a student in central London for one semester. There's a restaurant, and it's called the Texas Embassy. The Texas Embassy is a Tex-Mex restaurant in the middle of London in the building that was the historic Texas Embassy when, once upon a time, Texas was an independent nation. If you show a Texas driver's license in the Texas Embassy, you get a free margarita. What does that have to do about theology? Nothing. Just a pro tip. I thought I was going to enjoy the Texas Embassy because I was homesick as a native Texan. And if you know anything about Tex-Mex restaurants in Texas, the chips and the salsa are free. 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 They come out like bread and butter. You don't have to pay for it. And that's what you get. So whenever I was in London at the Texas Embassy, I just knew free chips and salsa. Guess what? In London, there are no free chips and salsa. My million dollar idea was that there needs to be a legitimate Tex-Mex restaurant, not just in London, but basically anywhere I go. I thought someone should do that. Why doesn't that exist? There's Tex-Mex restaurants everywhere. Why not an authentic Tex-Mex restaurant in London? I do that a lot. Do what? I say other people should be doing these things that I have great ideas about. Working in a church, I know that other people do that too. Someone should do this. Wouldn't it be great if someone did that? To talk about your personal power means that you might be the only person capable of doing exactly the thing that you want to have done. I love that in the Presbyterian Church, in the Reformed Church generally, that we understand ourselves to be a royal priesthood, that each and end of every individual person has the power to search Scripture, to pray, to offer forgiveness. That's the power that you have individually and that power is built up collectively when we join together. But make no mistake, it starts by your following the Spirit and recognizing what power you have. The next time you're tempted to say, wouldn't it be wonderful if? Somebody should. I hope you remember that you can speak first and foremost to yourself. And I have a little more to say about that. Uh, to help you know the power that you have structurally in the Presbyterian Church and spiritually based on the way that God works, if you can stick around to listen. I want to talk about Moses. If you remember the story of the call of Moses, he's wandering with sheep whenever he comes to Mount Horeb and he sees a bush that is burning but not consumed. God speaks to Moses and says, you are the person, the person who will lead my people out of slavery. And Moses says, um, I don't think so. I don't even talk good, or whatever the Hebrew version of that is. Moses didn't quite recognize the plan that God had for him. He saw his own weaknesses rather than what was valuable about him. Surely God had seen the way that Moses responded when he saw his own people being treated harshly by Egyptian taskmasters. God recognized what was available and powerful about Moses, and God knows God's own power, the power to write straight lines with crooked sticks, to allow people to do more than they understand that they're capable of. That's the power that you have. 
Moses had to be convinced that he was the right person. Ultimately, Moses had to have Aaron come alongside him to help. But still, God chose to use Moses. For those tasks that we think someone else should do, before that comes out of our mouths, I encourage you to think about where that sense of purpose and calling might be coming from. How might God be calling not someone, anyone, to do what is right, but how might God be calling you to do what's right? God sees our strengths, God knows our weaknesses, and God is able to work with them. That if need be, God can bring an Aaron alongside of us. But nonetheless, we need to recognize that God has chosen over and over again to work through people, with people, for God's purposes, giving vision and sight to what is good and very, very good, if we're open to it, if we don't pass the buck. And so that is the power that you have as a child of God, gifted and equipped by God to do God's work in the world. And if you choose to pass the buck, if you have a vision or a hope for what Woods might be doing, what you might be doing, what the world might be doing, but you choose not to act on it, perhaps there's no one else in the entire world who has the vision that God has given to you, the skills that God has given to you to accomplish that purpose. There is a triple tradition in Matthew, Mark, and in John where Jesus says that I have come not to be served, but to serve. To the extent that we follow Jesus' lead, our ability to serve one another, to have visions and insight into how we can be a help, we follow Jesus' lead when we do that. Whenever we say, uh, there should be something like Herondale free lunch, I don't know the particular history of how that started, but it took at least one person's vision to say, this needs to change. This is something I am capable of bringing to fruition. God uses lots of people to do lots of things, but in all of those things, if we dig into the history, we find distinct personalities who bring them to fruition, where it's almost impossible to imagine that things would be the way they are without those figures. And while it's easy to look at people like Martin Luther King or George Washington, who were so instrumental in bringing those things about, every business, every idea has someone who's worked behind it to make it come to be. If you have visions for how things are supposed to be, that's on you. Perhaps God is using you and no one else to bring it to fruition because we follow Jesus when we choose to act on those impulses, to imagine the ways things can be, and to make them happen. Without that impulse to take the bull by the horns, there's no guarantee that it happens. In Hebrews, there's a story where we learn that God has called us a royal priesthood. Often, Holy jobs, I talked about this a little bit on Labor Day, holy jobs are relegated to clergy, to people in official positions of church power or government power or certain offices. But in the notion that we are a royal priesthood, notice that the term is we. There is no distinction, said the Reformers, between a parishioner and a priest in the uh, to the degree that God can call anyone to do anything. Moses had no official credentials whenever he saw the burning bush. Peter was simply a fisherman whenever Jesus asked, follow me. We need to recognize the powers that we have, the powers of imagination, the powers of coordination, and the power of our calling that God gives to each and every one of us to make the world this much better in a way that only we can. So I hope the next time you see something that you wish was a little bit different, 
you take a second to imagine how much time and energy could you commit to purposes that need your attention, that need your power. Because without you, I guarantee there are certain things in this world that cannot happen, that will not happen, if you're not willing to put your shoulder to the wheel. When you pray tonight, I hope you imagine the way the world can be and what you could do to that end. Perhaps you hear God nudging you and urging you to do something for good, something for love, something for peace and justice. That's what I've been musing about. I hope you do too uh, today and every day. I'll see you next Monday.